Good morning, friends. It's so good to be here with you this morning as we wrap up this series, Summer in the Psalms. Today, I'm speaking to you from the narthex on the main campus. Narthex is just sort of the formal word for the entryway to a sanctuary. Now, entryways or lobbies, they may not be the spaces that we tend to pay the most attention to. We may tend to focus on where we're going, the places where we're going to be spending the most time. But when I think about Sunday mornings here at MDUMC, the narthex plays such a vital role. It's where people come in and encounter the smiling faces of our ushers and our greeters. It's where baptismal families gather themselves before they go to sit down together. It's where people come to receive a bulletin or directions to the nursery. It's where family and friends are greeted and handshakes are exchanged and hugs are given and received. So before we ever enter into the worship space, we first encounter God out here in one another. As I think about this, I remember all of you being here with you and what it's like for all of us to worship in community with our whole being. So as we think about worship this morning, I invite you to hear these words from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. even though we could probably spend a whole year in this book if we wanted, still we've journeyed quite a way through a ways through the Psalms together in these five weeks. We started with worship, how the Psalms form us to worship God in all times and places and all circumstances. Then we moved to creation, how every created being, every created thing from the cone snail to the capybara has a role to play in God's ordering of the universe. We talked about the power of lament and what it means for us to cry out to God. And we move to the Psalms that teach us wisdom, the ones that lead us in God's own paths. And today we move back to worship. We end where we began. Not because we've run out of things to talk about. Even in these four categories, we haven't nearly exhausted the Psalms. There are about a million different ways we could categorize them. If this is a road trip through the book, there are so many different roadside stops we could make. But we decided to do this, your pastors did, we decided to end where we began because we want to recognize that this journey through the Psalms, for all of us, it isn't just a one-time linear thing. As the seasons of our lives cycle in and out, as our very days contain their own rhythms that change over time, we return to the Psalms again and again, and though we encounter the same words and the same themes, we find that we have changed as a result of our living. So the truths that we find in the Psalms are illuminated in new light every time. It's like when you come back home after a vacation or after a long trip, you're coming back to the most familiar place, but you see things in new ways because you've been gone. You appreciate things that you never have before. You See them with new eyes because you've lived elsewhere for a while. So it is with the Psalms. So it is with our worship every week. When I hear Psalm 126, I think about Walt Whitman, who writes, Do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. These six verses, these short verses, contain joy and sorrow, memory and hope. Our worship is large enough to contain multitudes. And even though the psalm is just a few lines, it tells us about God in the past, the present, and the future. 
God who is the subject of our worship, the foundation of our communal life. First, the psalmist sings of a time when God restored the fortunes of the nation, when Israel was saved out of calamity and people everywhere looked and saw and said, God has done great things for them. And the joy was so full that it felt like a dream, like it couldn't even be real. That Hebrew phrase that's used over and over in the psalm that's translated songs of joy in the NIV, it really means something more like a cry or a shout of joy, like a peal of laughter coming out that can't be contained. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. But we notice that those verbs are in the past tense. The joy isn't in the present, it's a memory. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, when God did it before. Many scholars think that first part of the psalm, this memory of God restoring the people, refers to Israel's return from exile. And if it does, we see that even though they've returned to the land, even though the goal, the dream, has been achieved, all is still not right. Because in verse 4, the psalmist cries out for restoration again, this time asking for it in the present. So we move from the Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy directly into this cry to restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Isn't that the way our lives work? We get somewhere and it's good and we just want to stay and we expect to stay. But life moves and we change and we grow and things crack and break and get put back together. And we too find ourselves, just like the psalmist, in need of God's restoration, in need of God's salvation over and over again. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. The Negev is a desert whose name comes from the word dry or parched, so we're getting pretty literal here. Restore our fortunes like streams in the driest desert. Now, streams in this desert, they don't exist all the time. Most of the time, most of the year, if you were to go out looking for them, you'd just find dry creek beds that had been carved out by water that flowed there long ago. But the writer of this psalm knows that when the rainy season comes just for the briefest of times, those dry beds will fill to overflowing. The dryness itself is a promise because it holds the memory of the rain. And so the psalmist prays, Restore our fortunes, Lord, for we are dry and we believe the rains will come, but we don't know when. And then we hear, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Conventional wisdom would tell us you reap what you sow, but not here. Those who sow with tears will reap with shouts of joy. The psalmist uses that same term again that means cries of joy or shouts of joy, the kind of joy that can only exist because joy has not always been present the kind of deep joy that can only well up from within a person because deep sorrow has first been known. The kind of joy that comes from seeds cast in faith even when all is not right. The kind of joy that grows from seeds watered by tears that are holy. In our singing, in our praying, in our worship together, there is room for it all. It's enough of a miracle, that ordinary seed grows into ordinary grain against all the threats, against it, against all odds. But when our God touches the seeds that are sown in sorrow and in hope, the fruit we see becomes cries of joy. This is our promise. This is the core of who we are as a worshiping body a people who bring our full selves, our full humanity before God, and God looks at it in love, looks at us in love, and says, I can work with this. I can work with all of this. This psalm is one of the songs of ascent, a song that would be sung by pilgrims who were going up to Jerusalem for the high holy days. And I imagine pilgrims walking and singing this song and 
carrying the weight of their ancestral stories, not weight in a negative sense, not a weight that's too heavy, but one that matters, because these stories formed their people. They're remembering what God has done in the past, and they're praying for the same in the present as they walk. J. Clinton McCann writes this, While we joyfully recall and celebrate the new things God has done among us and for the world, we also continue to exist as finite and fallible human beings who will always need to pray, restore our fortunes, O Lord. He continues, the tears and the joy, the hurt and the hope, the suffering and the glory perennially belong together in the life of faith. The people of God in all places and times live by both memory and hope. Do you notice that in this psalm, even in the weeping, the hands of the sowers are not empty? In the weeping, they hold the seeds that are to be sown. And in the rejoicing, they hold the sheaves of the harvest in their hands. First the promise, and then the fulfillment. Whatever season we may find ourselves in, this psalm sings to us that our hands are never empty and we will never be left alone. This is the life of faith that we live, the rise and fall of it again and again, but not on our own because these ancient words will carry us if we will let them. I said earlier that there are so many different ways we can categorize the psalms if we choose and One of my favorite ways is from the work of Walter Brueggemann, who draws on the works of others as well. And it's this, that in this book, there are psalms of orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. Orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. So orientation, the songs that are full-on, straightforward, praise and thanksgiving, there's no tension there. That's where we all begin. Disorientation, the songs that come when we've been dislocated, when we find ourselves in exile or in despair, when our old order and our old structure have somehow collapsed or been disrupted. These are the valley of the shadow. And psalms of reorientation, the songs that remember passing through that valley even though they've now come out of it. The songs that don't forget that sorrow or cast it aside, but they incorporate it into this song of a new life, a new life that is both a surprise and a gift. So we return in the Psalms full circle to this place of praise and worship, but we have been changed in our living. We are not the same. Brueggemann writes that our lives are seasons of scattering and gathering. Our worlds are destroyed and our worlds are formed. This psalm bears witness to both. Our worship, if it is faithful, bears witness to both. T.S. Eliot wrote a short collection of poems called Four Quartets, and in the fourth one toward the very end, he writes this. With the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. The end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. Friends, we will sing the Lord's songs in an unknown land and we will sing them when we return home. And in the meantime, we will have lived. We will have laughed and cried, and tasted, and seen. And so though home will be familiar, our hearts will be new, our songs will be new, our worship will be new every time. May we spend not just a summer in the Psalms, but our entire lifetime. May we again and again come to the place we began and find that we know it for the first time. In the name of of God who creates and redeems and sustains all things and us. Amen. Let us pray.
Oh God, as we end these weeks together in this portion of your word, we give you thanks for the truths that have been revealed, and we ask that they would revisit us again and again in due time. Help us as your people to cling to memory and to hope, even as we lament, even as we rejoice. We ask these things in the name of your Son, who made these psalms his own prayers. Amen.